Welcome to your final lesson on The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. It's Mrs Bart here to take you through chapters 45 all the way to the end, which is historical notes. And the title of today's lesson is The Darkness Within or the Light. For today's lesson, you will need your usual equipment. You'll be making particular use of the annotation pen today. Three learning objectives today. First of all, A01 to understand how character, plot and themes are resolved. Secondly, to examine Atwood's use of ambiguity, narrative mode and the structural device of the epilogue. That's of course an A02 objective. And the last objective, which is an A05, is to facilitate interpretations of the ending. Do press pause if you need to get yourself organised. And before we move on, just a reminder to turn the notifications off on your phone. So here's today's do now. The overall question of today's lesson, our line of inquiry is, how does the ending resolve prevailing themes in the novel? I'd like you to have a look at the statement in the box on the left hand side. <coughs> Throughout the novel, Offred has maintained an internal struggle against the system and a cautious outward struggle. The do now is to choose two textual details that show this from these chapters but also I'd like you to range elsewhere in the text and explain. By explain I mean the statement in the box on the left hand side. There's a challenge as well. I'd like you to, if you accept the challenge, include an exploration of the view that luck saves Offred, she does not save herself press pause to grapple with this do now and press play when you're ready to hear some thoughts from me. So Offred's story ends really abruptly and uncertainly um, which kind of illustrates this jolt that she had in um, the previous chapters, chapter 44, where she's reminded that she is actually living in a totalitarian regime. Anybody is vulnerable and people are constantly poised on the edge of arrest or execution, rightly or wrongly. Um, Offred has learnt about Offglen's death um, from meeting the new Offglen and she finds out that Serena knows about her visits to Jezebel and she's possibly rescued by Nick's intervention and all this happens on the same day. The day after the Particacution, in fact. So <laughs> events are moving very, very quickly and Atwood is picking up the pace incredibly towards the end of the novel, as often dystopic fiction writers do. But almost as if a fast forward has been pressed in terms of the action, Offred seems to be sort of frozen in time and she is virtually doing nothing. Things are happening to her. She's, she's not making them happen. Um, Atwood is demonstrating Offred's complete lack of agency here. Um, it is one of those classic night chapters, of course, and Offred doesn't do much in these chapters but think. And thinking is very important, as we've discussed earlier. Um, but yeah, she, she's got no agency here. She's, she's spending time, hours perhaps, alone in her room, very passively, maybe listlessly, contemplating murdering Serena. Suicide, that's not a new thought to her. Possible escape. But of course, none of these thoughts form into action plans. It seems now at this point of the novel that Gilead has finally stripped Offred of her power. She's still thinking, of course, but her power to act. So in this moment of ultimate crisis, that's all she can do. 
think, be anxious, and wait to see what happens. And of course, what happens is that a black van's about to arrive, and we all know what that means. You know, when she realises at the end of chapter 44 with the new off Glen that there is very real threat in this society and she is a vulnerable person, she's terrified. And she realises that she would actually rather give in than die. And actually it's at this point when she admits this to herself that something in the form of help arrives. Atwood is suggesting here that in Gilead, these tiny rebellions, which offered herself as acknowledged as, as futile and silly, even in the beginning of the novel, these resistances of one person, even big dramatic ones like Moira, um, they don't necessarily come to anything. And Offred ends up escaping here, not because of her resistance, her action planning, her rebellions, but actually despite of passivity on her part. So you could agree with this idea that luck saves Offred. Um, if she doesn't actually do much to save herself. Although you could argue on the other side of it that Offred's ability to think and think clearly has kept her intact mentally and has contributed to the form of survival that has sustained her to this point. At the end of Offred's narrative, but not the end of the novel, as we're to discuss later, is this final sentence from her. And so I step up into the darkness within, or else the light. If you have a look at the image that I've got next to that, it's an image that I hope will depict the idea of ambiguity to you. Ambiguity is not just an idea, it's actually a literary method, an authorial method that writers use. And you can see how with the arrows pointing all sorts of different ways to do with one sort of central idea that's being discussed, um, you know, ambiguity operates on the basis of leaving things open, vague and unclear. And sometimes there are really important reasons for why authors do that, the kind of meanings that they can create from that. So we're going to have a look at that. So, some things for you to do. When she learns of Offglen's suicide, Offred states this, <coughs> quote, I want to keep on living in any form. You'll find that on page 300 if you want to underline it. What does the phrase in any form seem to mean? Next, how close are we to knowing more about the mysteriously ambiguous character, Nick? So it's not just plot that is ambiguous, it's, it's people in Atwood's novel. I'd like you to select evidence and explain what is revealed by it. And in doing that, I don't want you to just consider what Nick says, but um, also have a look in this chapter um, at what Serena and the commander say as well. So I've said ambiguity um, can be applied in lots of different ways to characterisation, um, but also very much so in this chapter with the unfolding of the plot. Atwood's use of ambiguity in unfolding the plot is powerful. So I'd like you to note down any questions you have about what is happening in the plot. And then once you've done that, consider the question, why do you think Atwood keeps things so vague and unclear? So press pause while you grapple with those tasks and press play when you're ready to hear some further thoughts from me. <coughs> okay, so... What's happening? Well, the black van, the dreaded black van pulls in and it's Nick who opens the door of Offred's room. Offred jumps to the conclusion that he's betrayed her, um, but he whispers to her that she should go with the eyes. He tells her they're in Mayday and have 
come to save her. Offred knows that he might well be an eye. The eyes probably know all about Mayday anyway. But what options does she have? You know, this is her last chance. She has to go. This is probably where we get that reference that I've quoted in the title of this slide. She walks down the stairs to meet the men waiting for her. And this is why I asked you to have a look at what Serena and the commander say as well as Nick. Serena demands to know Offred's crime. And from that, Offred realises, and so does the reader, that Serena can't have been the one to call these men in. The men say they cannot tell her. Then the commander demands to see a warrant and these eyes or possibly the men from Mayday perhaps as Nick has said say that she's been arrested for violation of state secrets. So it's clear that neither Serena or the commander seem to know what's going on either. The only person who professes to know these men and why they're here is Nick, if we can believe him. Offred's not sure. Serena is cursing Offred. Offred follows the eyes to the van waiting outside. When the van comes, Offred has no way of knowing at this point whether it comes to save her or to bring her to her death. But she has to go. Either way, she has to go. We discussed the underground female road last um, a couple of lessons ago and it's clear that in many oppressive regimes and certainly the case for Gilead the oppressed in in this case women cannot escape alone they need people to help them attain freedom so she doesn't know at this point and neither do we as readers whether her story is going to end in either darkness or light um, and, but she's stepping into it because she doesn't have a choice. This, of course, is interesting because we've been studying streetcar as well. And when you do paper two, you may well choose that the two texts that you're going to compare are handmade and streetcar. And isn't it interesting that one of the many parallels between her and Blanche, Offred and Blanche, is when it comes to the actions of strangers and their reliance on strangers. And this is, of course, the plight of the oppressed female characters in literature time and time and time again. Now we come to the part of the novel which, I mean, I often have a chuckle at this, but in the past students have said to me, oh, do you have to read the historical notes? They've thought that they were sort of a, an appendix that was, you know, that it was optional whether to read it. The epilogue, the historical notes, is the ending of The Handmaid's Tale. If you don't read that, you don't know what happens. <laughs> Offred's story has finished, but there's more. I've headed up this section of our exploration, Old and New Voices, and as you can see, what the historical notes, this epilogue, depicts is that all along Alfred has been making cassettes they're like you know ask your parents what a cassette is yeah, on a very old-fashioned ways of, of making your own recordings and it's Alfred's voice that we've been hearing all along in this novel we've done our own explorations about the meanings that we can draw from this unreliable narrator Alfred but we've got a new voice now a new voice that has been listening, in fact, to the old voice. So here's what I'd like you to do. Here's a quotation from page 316. The voice is a woman's, and according to our voice print experts, the same one throughout. Now, this person speaking is Professor Pijotto, and that's what they're saying about the cassettes. Atwood makes a dramatic switch to create narrative distance here. We now have a new narrator who is delivering a symposium lecture 
presumably in an academic institution. We find out many, many hundreds of years after the story of The Handmaid's Tale. So I'd like you to have a little think about what effect this narrative switch has on the reader. Then I'd like you to select some textual evidence that provides a clear and analytical explanation of Gilead. Up to now, we've had Offred's version only. And then the last thing I'd like you to do for this slide is, what information are we given by Professor Pajotto that hasn't already been provided by Offred's narrative? And how does this information add to our understanding of character and plot? Plenty to do and think about here. So press pause, take your time, have a good hard think, make your annotations, write your answers. And um, when you're ready for some thoughts from me, press play. Again, try to avoid the temptation to do that before you've done some hard thinking of your own. <coughs> okay, so... After this ending, with its clear leap into the unknown, an epilogue follows. This is a structural device that writers use to add something extra after technically a plot has closed and finished. Even though the ending is ambiguous, we have something more to look at and think about. The year, as stated, is 2195, which is over 200 years later from the setting of the book. It's a very, very interesting chapter, this epilogue. It's a lot of different things at once. As I've said before, and we've studied before, Offred is the narrator of the story, it's first person. We, we know she's an unreliable narrator. She makes no bones about it. She tells us that she's unreliable. She sometimes makes things up and, and tells us as readers that that's the version that she wants us to, to work with. Um, but now we have a bit more of an objective explication of Gileadian society from an academic point of view. Thinking about academic points of view, Atwood does poke fun of academic conferences, There's, it's a parody. And also there are parts of the historical notes that are offensive to the reader and the sentiments that readers of The Handmaid's Tale will have built over the course of reading the novel. You know, as readers, we have sympathised with the protagonist. We've suffered through Offred's torments. And it's quite shocking for us as readers um, and I think Atwood wants it to be to just hear her life being discussed like a case study in front of a, an amused intellectual audience some of the things that are mentioned about her are joked about this narrative and historical distance treats the Offred who we have come to love and sympathise with as a, a quaint relic and nothing more than that. So, Professor Pichotto makes references to Gilead's very clever synthesis of ancient customs and modern beliefs. We talked about Gilead's cleverness last lesson. And, you know, if we hadn't come to that conclusion ourselves as readers, he discusses the use of biblical narratives to justify the institution of the handmaids. He mentions the similarities between the particucian and ancient fertility rites. As alert readers, we noted all of this anyway. But it's interesting that a professor hundreds of years on is explaining this clearly and analytically to an academic audience. The epilogue does a bit more than that. It reveals information that we didn't know already and inferences that we wouldn't have been able to make as a result. We've got information from beyond Offred's experience. 
we find out the identity of, of Fred's commander. You know, there's references to a commander Waterford and a commander Judd. Um, we learn about some of the purges that took place frequently under the regime where, you know, some of the corruption was um, dealt with, especially when commanders felt themselves to be above the law. And we know that Offred's commander was one of those. Um, and we also learn about um, something that we talked about a couple of lessons ago, the underground female road um, was foreshadowed a few chapters back and we learned that that was actually a very successful strategy of underground resistance and managed to infiltrate the command structure as well. So by telling us that the Handmaid's Tale was actually transcribed from cassette tapes found in an underground female road safe house, we now have less ambiguity in this epilogue about the novel's ending and of the character of Nick, both previously ambiguous elements of the story. Um, it is, of course, a powerful ending and powerful because it is ambiguous. Um, but if Offred was at a safe house, then it wasn't a van belonging to the eyes that she got into. But it was, as Nick said, um, a Mayday operation. And we then, from that, can infer that Nick definitely was what he said he was, a member of Mayday. He may have also been an eye, uh, and so that makes him a double agent of sorts. <coughs> and it is his clear attempt to get Offred out of the country. Now, there are things that still remain ambiguous. We don't know if Alfred did get out of the country. Her final fate still remains a mystery. But we know that Nick is no longer ambiguous. He is faithful and he is part of the resistance. And um, if Alfred intended to survive, then it seems like Nick was her best bet in the end. Okay, a bit more on the epilogue, um, and I've titled this slide 2195, which is when the Historical Notes Symposium happens, and I've actually titled it, There May Be Trouble Ahead, and uh, if you have a look at the image that goes along with that, it's this idea of, you know, pressing the warning buzzer, and I want you to consider um, Atwood's intentions. So I've got a couple of quotations, one from page 317 and one from page 324. I'd like you to underline and highlight them. And then I'd like you to consider how to annotate them. So I'd like you to annotate your text with ideas about what you think is shown about society at roughly 200 years post Gilead. Um, and if you'd like to, there's a challenge um, and that's to consider the amount of attention Pajotto gives to various aspects of Gilead in his lecture. What have you found when you do that? And what might this suggest? So an annotation exercise for you to get your teeth into. And press play when you're ready to um, add to your notes. Okay, let's look at that quotation on page 317. Also, Gileadian society, this is Professor Pajotto speaking, was under a good deal of pressure, demographic and otherwise, and was subject to factors from which we ourselves are happily more free. Our job is not to censure, but to understand. And then there was general applause. Hmm. Well, Pajotto's comment that Gilead should not be judged too harshly because any judgment we make about history and other cultures would be based on our own cultural assumptions is an interesting one. You can imagine academics speaking like this, but 
The Handmaid's Tale is a story of suffering. And if that's what he's managed to get out of it, this does call into question the way that people look upon history as being in the past. We have modern day equivalents of this, don't we? When people look at black history or the history of the oppression of women, they define it as something that's in the past or from the past and not relevant to today. You could, you know, if you want to argue that these things aren't eradicated in modern society, it shouldn't stop you from making the human connection with the people who suffered, even if it's centuries ago in history. So it's interesting how Piaggiotto seems to echo um, some of the academics that we hear today. As readers, you know, we have gone through the story with Offred. We've sympathised with her. Atwood has demanded that of us. And we have already judged Gilead to be evil, tyrannical, soul-destroying. So what are we to make as readers of this appeal from this academic of the future to understand the ruling elite of Gilead? And even the applause that follows it, slightly distasteful for us as readers wonder if Atwood is suggesting here that having a kind of moral ambivalence might sow seeds for future evils. One thing that's important about history is to learn from it. And we're wondering whether the academics are able to do that. It's difficult for us to process as readers that the professor and the conference attendees are not as moved as we are by Offred's plight. And yet they're reading the same story that we have. They seem to be able to discuss her as a sort of pawn in a reproductive game. They belittle her tale as being sort of made up of the crumbs of history. You know, she might be educated. How seriously do we take her? If you look at the quotation from page 324... I'll read it. Some of them could have been filled by our anonymous author had she had a different turn of mind. She could have told us much about the workings of the Gileadean Empire had she had the instincts of a reporter or spy. What would we not give now for even 20 pages or so of printout from Waterford's private computer? Well, that's very telling, isn't it? It seems that the professor is openly prizing a few printed pages from the commander's computer over Offred's very compelling tale of suffering, the story that we have aligned ourselves with as readers. It's a belittling of a woman's life. It's a glorification of a man's computer. And it suggests that this new society, 200 years on, might be free from Gilead. Is it free from patriarchal leanings? Atwood is clearly posing a question here. Offred and her trauma are remote to this group. But Atwood, the author, is urging us to think that any society, however historically remote, may not be too far off from this fate if it doesn't learn the lessons of history. It's not unimaginable for societies like ours like Professor Piaggiotto's, to fancy themselves as progressive, but actually hold the seeds of oppression, whether patriarchal or otherwise. And this complacency and self-satisfaction from the academics discussing Gilead is presented as dangerous, as a warning. I've titled my plenary with the final sentence of the novel, and it's how Professor Pijotto ends his lecture. Are there any questions? But I like to fancy that actually it's 
Atwood, I know she writes everything anyway as the author, but I'd like to fancy that that's the question that she is posing to her audience in the novel. What are you questioning now in yourself, in society, in history, as a result of this fiction? So, a couple of things for you to do. We've often discussed the significance of names of people and places in relation to identity. We did that in the early days of studying this novel. I would like you, working with the historical notes section, to trace all references to names in this section. That's people and places. Where and why does Atwood use names to suggest new perspectives of this world? Once you've done that, the task that um, I would like you to submit is this second one. The closing line, are there any questions, invites the reader to interpret the phenomenon of Gilead. Dystopic fiction is always cautionary in its intention. It's always a warning. How might different literary theoretical perspectives interpret Gilead? And that would be a main body paragraph that's AO1 plus AO2 plus AO5. <coughs> so a beautiful claim in response to this question, supported by evidence, analysed for authorial method, and finishing up with a multifaceted interpretive perspective analysis. I'm going to offer you a bit of guidance there and say to you, just to remind you that there are four theoretical perspectives that we work with at A level. There's the Marxist perspective that asks you to look at class tensions, class divides, the distribution of wealth in societies and people's relationship to the means of production. Um, there's a feminist perspective, which we have dipped into an awful lot in studying The Handmaid's Tale, which is how women are presented and how the power structure of patriarchy is relevant to the text. Um, but don't forget also the psychoanalytical perspective, which asks you to delve into the conscious and subconscious mind of the drivers and inhib inhibitors of, of characters that have agency in stories, what shapes their behaviour. And something you haven't spent a lot of time on, but there is some opportunity to do it here and in other places of the novel, a post-colonial reading of the novel, which aims to look at how um, matters of race and race theory might be significant in this novel. We had um, a long time ago we did a lesson um, which asked us to look at a news report um, that was happening in Gilead and it talked about the sons of Ham and how um, for the most part people of colour have been um, obliterated in Gilead. Um, so that's another opportunity to look at the ending through the lens of these theoretical perspectives. So I'll be very interested to see um, how your paragraph turns out and what you make of these different lenses that will help you to come to different understandings of the ending here. Um, you submit that according to the dates and instructions of show my homework. I'm going to look forward to reading them and giving you some feedback on them. Um, I'm just going to pause so that you can do task one and task two is the one I want you to submit on Show My Homework, so you don't need to do that just yet. So just pause to do the task about names and naming, and I'll give you some response to that when you press play again. Okay, so in the epilogue, Atwood kind of inverts Gilead. She sets the epilogue in a time that is so historically remote that we realise very quickly that Gilead has been overthrown, this terrible world. 
in opposition to the Gilead's white, male-dominated patriarchy, in the New World, it's whites that are the subjects of study, rather than being the scholars and part of the ruling elite. If we are to infer anything from the names, we have professors with names like Johnny Running Dog and Mary Ann Crescent Moon. Well, those names are, if you know anything about Native American culture, they are reminiscent of Native American names. So we have to infer that Gilead, which of course is old America, has gone through various ages in which somehow the indigenous, original indigenous population has assumed um, power and control again. Um, the universities that are referred to are in northern Canada, Nunavut, um, and they tell us that the map of the world has been remade. So it's a very different world from a racial and cultural perspective. And we realise that in the same way that white people studied the third world, it seems now that people of colour are studying the well, what we understand now as the Western world. Um, the chair of the conference announces a speech from Professor Gopal Chatterjee from the Department of Western Philosophy at the University of Baroda, India. So, of course, that's another professor of colour there. So, a very different world with new cultural perspectives and it seems like um, something that actually, even now, professors of demographics have predicted in the future that um, black and minority ethnic populations are going to be the majority population. Um, I think the current thinking from an Oxford professor is by 2060. Um, so it seems that Atwood has seized upon that in this idea uh, of, of, the, um, of the society in the historical notes. I'll just say one more thing before I leave you with your final task, which you're going to submit on Show My Homework anyway. This closing line, are there any questions, continues this idea of ambiguity, you know, this deliberately open-ended conclusion. And I think what Atwood is asking us to do here in the end of The Handmaid's Tale is to begin a discussion of the issues the story raises.